Greetings, everybody. I'm Nate Angel from Creative Commons. You're at the uh, Creative Commons AI Outputs and the Public Commons webinar. This is second in our series. Yesterday, we had AI inputs in the Public Commons. Today, your host will be Kat Walsh, our general counsel here at Creative Commons. And so I'd, I'd really like to welcome everybody who's here today, um, both as uh, as an attendee, but also our panelists. But I'd like to, to welcome Andres Guadamuz, who's a reader in intellectual property law at the University of Sussex. Um, Daniel Ambrosi, an artist. Um, say no more. <laughs> that's a that's a, a great title. Um, contains contains multitudes. Mark Reidel, a uh, professor at the School of Interactive Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology, commonly known as Georgia Tech. And then Mira and I are uh, copyright specialists at the North and Alberta Institute of Technology. So those are the people we have assembled here today. I really um, thank them for coming. And um, I am going to uh, step out of the way and pass the baton to my dear colleague, Kat Walsh, who will then start the conversation for y'all. Thanks, Nate. And again, thanks so much to all our panelists for being here. Uh, I'm going to start out with a question that lets people introduce themselves in a way that is not just reading their bios out on the screen. Uh, so everybody here is invited because they have an output. So I'd like to ask everybody with a starting question to uh, tell us a little bit about your background in AI and how that informs your perspective on the questions that we're going to ask today. Thank you very much for, for having me here today. Uh, this would be a good time to confess that uh, I have no artistic talent whatsoever. And my qualifications are not in law. My doctorate is in communication. And prior to that, I had a BSc in mathematics. But largely what I've been you know, fascinated with for close to 20 years now is um, the, interlap uh, the overlap between media development and copyright history. So right now it is fascinating to watch a new industry come to light, you know, in real time and see it as an opportunity to perhaps, you know, modify some of the parts of the copyright system that I think will not be well suited to an AI world. All right, next on my screen is Daniel. Hi everyone. Um, so fine art is my fourth and by far hardest career. Um, it really just came up unexpectedly um, after an aha moment at a canyon in Utah, where after basically decades of experimenting with uh, various modes of photography, I had a breakthrough uh, with a technique to more accurately capture how humans see landscapes. Um, that started me on this path uh, back in 2011. And in 2015, the summer of 2015, Google released Deep Dream, which for a summer became a novel sensation where a lot of people had fun turning their family photos into psychedelic nightmares. Um, I saw an opportunity to use it in a more subtle way to bring a cognitive element to my uh, giant landscapes. Uh, and ultimately I got a couple brilliant Silicon Valley engineers to super scale the software for my purposes and have been using it ever since. So fairly early on this happened in the sort of, in this surge of AI of creative uses of AI. I'm one of the few, if not <laughs> the only person still using Deep Dream uh, exclusively, although it's a unique um, version that uh, uh, that I have uh, on an Amazon um, quad G GPU compute server that uh, does my bidding. Um, but I've kept tabs very much. I've been uh, involved in a lot of uh, conferences and whatnot with other AI artists. And at some point, I would like to, when it makes sense, uh, talk about the spectrum of uses of AI art because it's all over the map and I'm just on one side of that. So we'll get into that further. But the pure motivation for me, I'm a pure, I'm a total opportunist. I'm using AI for a very specific reason to help um, communicate the landscape experience as fully as I possibly can. Um, and, and that's just one element in my work. So we can talk more about that later. Thanks. Great, and Andres? Yes, um, thanks. Um, um, I got started with this topic about 10 years ago, probably a little bit more. Um, I'm a self-described uh, copyright nerd. I like, um, I've been researching for, for a while and all, all of the interface between um, intellectual property and particularly copyright and uh, new technologies. So 
I do all of the uh, all of the buzzwords. I do blockchains and smart contracts, NFTs, and artificial intelligence. Specifically with artificial intelligence, I got interested from the text and data mining side for for a while when it was. Um, it was very, very, very niche. No one, no one was interested in 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 this. And eventually, now it's probably going to be the the source of a very large uh, lawsuits. Um, so yeah, I've been writing about this um, uh, for quite a while. Just like Daniel, I got very, very interested, in specifically uh, on on the input uh, sort of the output side, which is the one we're dealing today. Um, with a deep dream, I thought it was very interesting. I, I I created quite a few works, and since then I've been just writing and blogging about this uh, uh, and, and uh, getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, the right amount of trouble, I, I think. Yes, yeah. hopefully, yeah, it hasn't been too bad. Uh, and Mark. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I am an AI researcher. Um, and so I had a an opportunity in the early 2000s to start working with AI technologies that did creation. I work primarily in story generation, fairy tale generation, kind of text generation sorts of things. Um, and you know, it didn't take me long to, to realize that there was this weird dichotomy going on because once you have your hands in the code and you know everything that's going on inside your computer program, you really start to think about um, creativity and where kind of creativity lands, you know, inside the algorithms, but also inside the engineers who built the algorithms versus the user. Nowadays, we talk about prompting uh, these neural networks, so the prompter. So where, who is responsible for creativity? Can we call these systems create? creative and if we do how does that creativity manifest itself through the algorithms and the models and the data and the user interfaces and i'll start start out with the question that's going to frame the rest of the discussion which is uh, are works generated by by ai different than works created by humans and how would you say that's true or how not yeah this might be a good time for me to jump in and explain this spectrum because um what i've seen in, in the, uh, what is it, since uh, 2015, this, the, uh, what people have been doing with AI art, there really is a spectrum that on one side is what I would call AI augmented art or human AI hybrid art, um, which is kind of where I am. I'm applying AI in a very specific way as kind of an intelligent paintbrush to add surprising detail at a close up level. Uh, to my giant landscapes. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have works that are completely generated by AI, like you're seeing with the controversial text prompt uh, driven um, work that's happening with tools like Dolly and Midjourney. Somewhere in the middle, you have things like neural style transfer, where people are using styles of famous artists uh, and applying them to their own works, whether they be photographs or paintings. Um, and maybe further, you know, closer to the AI generated realm, but, but still um, uh, kind of in, in the mix somewhere is the creative adversarial networks that uh, folks like Ahmad El Gamal at uh, Rutgers University is doing, uh, essentially creating entirely new genres or, or art movements based on the history of art movements in the past. Um, the reason I think it's important to talk about that spectrum is that you can argue that the amount of original content that ends up in the output varies greatly. Um, you know, uh, and in the text AI generated stuff, it's, it's very little original content it is being generated from the AI in its entirety. And on my side, it's just one small element and everything in between. And some people may argue that what's original and, and what kind of credit the artist should be given would be based upon that percentage. Um, I want to say that that's a red herring and I don't believe in original content altogether. Um, I think there's nothing new under the sun. David Eagleman from Stanford University in, in his book, The Runaway Species, um, How Human Creativity Remakes the World, argues very, um, cogently that um, creativity ends up being a mix of breaking, bending, and blending what's come before. Uh, 
So, you know, for me, I don't believe so much in original content as I believe in original vision. And I take a very sort of liberal view. Uh, I personally am not interested in pursuing uh, the text prompt generated AI art stuff, but I'm really glad other people are. I'm really thrilled by it. I'm excited. I think some of the results are just gorgeous, uh, moving works of art. Um, but that's my personal opinion. Just one quick analogy I want to make about nothing, you know, about original content. Um, one of the subsets of landscapes that I, I work on are cityscapes. Uh, when you take a photo in Central Park or of, uh, you know, from, from a tower alongside Bryant Park in New York City or, or, or somewhat, you know, I've created that panorama using a camera. I've captured the designs of countless architects and landscape architects and, you know, artists that have created uh, you know, interesting billboards and so on. Um, do I need to credit all of those people? That's impossible. Uh, but, but, you know, someone takes a photo of the painted ladies in San Francisco, you know, those, those are creative works of art by the people that painted them. But the photo, you know, it, you understand what I'm saying? There's, um, I don't think the issue is so much original content as it is original vision that should be uh, celebrated and, and given copyright. And I'd just like to add to that, that you know, one thing, every time new media comes along, it, it's as if we're starting from scratch with copyright. You know, I don't know why, but it's just, that's the history. But you know, these are issues that we are already confronted with. Like what is original content? What is one person's contribution as compared to what it's taking for the world around it? And I mean, particularly in the music industry, this seems to just generate no end amount of litigation. So it, it's a challenge that already is present but, you know, I think it'll scale up considerably, you know, if we entertain the idea of independent AI creations, you know, having somehow you know, warranted complete copyright protection. Yeah. Mary, can you give us some more analogies to like when this has come up in the past and like uh, how those issues got resolved? Well, I mean, even at this present time, I and mean, what annoys me the most, I'm going to use the, you know, the dialogue of academic publishing. It's not uncommon for editors to want copyright permissions for every scrap of third party content that, you know, lends itself to that particular paper or book, you know, completely glossing over the, this is a much more than the sum of its parts, you know, that these all work together. So, you know, that is an ongoing problem that, you know, again, in academia of all realms of publishing, where quite often we know that, uh, you know, the writers are doing this for prestige, for reputation, it's not commercial, it's not like they're a starving artist. So, you know, the subtlety of why those works are created ought to factor in if we are, you know, even going to contemplate, you know, who needs to be, whose permission needs to be sought for those, you know, inner materials. So that's the one that, um, you know, again, annoys me every day. <laughs> I'm not sure if you want me to go, you know, further back into history. There's a common element, I think, between what um, Daniel and Mira are talking about. And in computer science and AI, we refer to, uh, I guess, I think two terms, intent and agency. Um, and agency is the extent to which anything has the ability to make choices. Um, I think one thing, at least at this current point in time, our AI systems, our creators don't have a lot of agency. They must get their intentions, their, uh, Daniel used the term vision, right, uh, from a user. Someone has to instigate the process, provide the specification for what's going to come out. Um, and so, you know, to me, that always means there is a human in the process somewhere. And then getting back to the, the question of like, how is, you know, AI generated art different from human art, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities. Uh, we talk about learning systems, learning from lots of different artists. Um, humans learn from artists as well, um, but the AI systems do this at scale. And I think scale is an important consideration uh, because the other thing that is different about AI systems, whether they're being used to augment or to kind of do art, you know, on their own is um, the speed at which they can iterate. So AI systems don't have, I think, this crucial element of, of what I call the blood, sweat, and tears of doing art. Uh, an AI system, a machine learning system, doesn't have to sacrifice 
other aspects of their daily lives. So artists sacrifice when they want to do art, they have to give up something else. Humans have constrained time, right? AI systems can generate very, very fast, very, very frequently. Um, people can use that to their advantage if they so choose, but the AI system never gives up anything to, to work, right? And I think that's an important consideration. It's also, I think, one of the reasons why I think human art will never be diminished. Um, it may be augmented, but I think um, as long as we recognize that humans are constrained in ways that computer systems aren't, there's something to value there. Hold on there. By human art, do you mean handmade? Um, I mean, okay, so you, you talk about a spectrum. So I mean things that are um, a little bit further down the spectrum from just push the go button, but have, and even I should acknowledge that even using AI technologies like stable diffusion and Dolly to get something you really want actually requires a lot of effort to get the prompt right, to get the, to iterate lots and lots of times. Maybe you actually throw images back through the computer process. So I think, you know, a lot of people say these systems are, are autonomous, right? They're not autonomous at all. Um, so when I talk about human art, I do think, I do kind of mean techniques or processes that involve more sub, on the more substantial side of human involvement. Can I just say that there has always been a bias towards handmade art in, 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 in that world, uh, but it's ill-founded. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, artists have been partly inventors using technology in their art. Uh, the movie Tim's Vermeer makes a very solid case that Vermeer may not have been an artist at all, not a trained artist at all, and that he actually turned himself into a human camera using optical aids. And he's celebrated as one of the greatest painters of all time, hundreds of years ahead of his time. Um, I actually wrote an article about this on Medium. I'll post the link. But um, I, th I think we need to recognize that artists have been using technology uh, deeply, um, basically forever. Mm -hmm. Even a paintbrush is, is, is a paintbrush, technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like to refer to the AI systems as, as smart paintbrushes, right? They're just... <laughs> really, really fancy tools. Yeah. Um, I think I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer the question uh, with a bit of a lawyerly, very, it depends. Uh, of course, it won't be. Uh, um, uh, I think that from, um, I'm, I'm going to take my personal perspective and legal perspective. I think that from a personal perspective, having been using these tools, I am fascinated by the technology. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked. I am absolutely, um, 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 whether or not what I'm producing is art, um, I cannot determine. I, I, I have no idea. I have no history. It, my friends and family really like it. Uh, my sister, who is an artist, uh, seems to like it. She she particularly she writes to me. She, we've never communicated more. She sometimes sends me, "Oh, the, the 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 llama is fantastic," or "Your your your sheep, your robotic sheep is amazing," uh, and she's an artist. So it, it, it's interesting how some people are responding. Now, from from legal perspective, I think that. Um, we have actually had quite a lot of discussion in copyright of what is art. And at least in, from the UK legal perspective, um, there are a lot of cases where judges have had to determine what is art, is this a piece of art? And the consensus, at least the legal consensus, and I think this is shared in many other, other jurisdictions, is that intention is what matters. If you are intending to create something that is artistic and it's art, it's going to be art. Um, one of the examples that one judge uh, used in, I think it was in Lucas Art, is that a pile of bricks in someone's driveway is not a work of art, it's not a sculpture, but a pile of bricks in the Tate Modern in London is a sculpture. <laughs> so um, the intention is, is what matters. And I think however that work came into being is not important, is the intention, is the result. If we, That is, I think, that the only way, at least from a legal perspective, that we can analyze this. Um, now, from a copyright perspective, I think that in, I, I strongly, strongly believe, and uh, I've, I'm on record uh, several times saying this, 
um, that um, some of this art should be protected by copyright. At least in the UK, we have uh, uh, section nine, paragraph three of this uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act that says that, that um, there is copyright in some of these works. If it's uh, computer generated works um, can be protected. Now, there is, a, there is a debate in other jurisdictions. There is a debate in the US. There is a debate in Europe on whether or not it, those works can be protected by copyright. And I think that it will be very uh, fact specific. It will depend on the amount of work that goes into the creation of work. Um, there are people that are trying to get registration of this in the US. So it's it's funny that uh, the US Copyright Office is already having to, to deal with a lot of, uh, of issues. Uh, and uh, I think that this is just starting. The debate is, is just starting. Yeah, I think one one thing that needs to be added to the debate is is not just about creation; it's about curation. So, as these tools become more advanced, curation becomes more important. And that guy that won that prize at the Colorado State Fair spent a lot of time curating those works. Uh, Ahmad at Rutgers, um, Ahmed at at Rutgers, um, you know, he has to go through hundreds and thousands of works to curate um, images that, that, that seem to be truly new and interesting. Um, I think every artist is a curator to some extent. What we're seeing now is the elevation of curation to art. Uh, that's changing. And, and um, I think it really has to be recognized as part of the vision. You could argue Vermeer was really more of a curator. He had an incredible eye for composition and subject matter and so on. He may have turned himself into a human camera, but it was his vision. Um, so you know, I think curation has to be a, an important part of that. Uh, <clears throat> I liked Mark's uh, language about agency, about like, and I think the copyright debates tend to go around that, like who, who is making these decisions? How much autonomy? How much autonomy did they have? And like, uh, is that something that you've seen change over time? Like, have your opinions on this changed over time as you've seen AI art get more sophisticated? So from my perspective, agency, it hasn't really changed. Um, so it's always, it always requires someone to push the go button and it always requires someone to provide some sort of input. I, well, I think what has changed is the amount of input. So I don't want to get all like, I'm old and stuff like that, right? But 10 years ago, setting up an AI algorithm involved getting your own training data, processing your own training data, which had a huge shape on what you got as an output. Um, now all that's done for you with these tools, the, um, the intent is now expressed in a much more simple way, more accessible way, you know, through maybe a, a few lines of text or an example image uh, to go along with it. So, but the, in I guess the way we've always expressed our intention on the system has has gotten has changed a little bit, um, and then agency and, and autonomy you can kind of talk in in hierarchies, right? So the high level vision, if you want to use that word, usually comes from external to the AI system, but then you know the system itself has agency over every single pixel, right? It gets the ultimate choice of every single color of every pixel. So if you talk about agency at that level then we can talk about autonomous decision-making in the AI system. But it's usually, it doesn't kind of, if it goes off the rails, it's because the algorithm is making an accident and it, not because it had a better idea. Um, right? They don't bring in their own meaning to it. Somewhere to me, this, you know, the development of AI, it's entirely plausible that more independence, more agency will ultimately become part of their systems. So to suggest that we alter the system of copyright um, on what we know now, you know, you would like to try to bulletproof it a little bit to, to imagine what happens when that day arrives. Because the system as it is right now, since its inception, so for over 300 years, has been founded on two principles, that you're protecting original work and that you are, you know, doing this, at least ostensibly, in the name of a human author. And um, that's where 
both of those principles now don't stand up as they did before. So again, I keep coming back to the copyright is not is not going to be an easy system to navigate if we go down that route. Now, just coming back to you know this, the dialogue and discussion, Canada is ostensibly discussing it, but um, as Andres uh, tweeted out recently, that um, our intellectual property office has already gone ahead and registered a work where a co-author is listed as an AI. And um, you know we just, you sort of have to shake your head. It's one of these things where I just sort of feel that copyright has so much meaning and you know flawed or otherwise in modern society that it's going to it's going to go down that path without you know real analysis as to what is the best solution. The joint uh, ownership is interesting because, as I say, you know you can have autonomy or agency at different levels. Um, I think the thing that bothers me the most is you know when AI systems can an AI system completely have complete agency and therefore own the copyright. Um, there's lots of legal reasons that I understand, and I'm not a lawyer, to say that that's a horrible idea. But I think, you know, I we can do a thought experiment, right? So what if I just, um, what if I had a random prompt generator and applied that random prompt gen generator Dolly, and then no human is prompting the, the Dolly and we get lots of pictures coming out of it. Um, someone still had to write the code to do the prompt random generator. So it just kind of pushes the human further, but it's really, really hard until we get to some sort of, you know, hyper science fiction-y sort of, you know, reality of AI um, where we don't see the human still having at least some distant uh, influence on, on well, the system. Well, a, a human would ultimately get involved, one would hope, uh, per, my comments about curation and Andre's comments about um, uh, what was it the the intention um, if the person is trying to exhibit this work uh, they there will be a curator and and an effort to exhibit it somewhere whether that's online or wherever and not just throwing up everything that the AI uh, created or produced. Um, I, I do think I, I mentioned uh, this idea of curators being elevated to artists uh, and just want to recognize that that is disruptive. Um, just like you could argue photographers, when cameras came along, uh, photographers were essentially curators. They, they would operate this tool and choose what to print and what to show and so on. Um, that's very much at play now. Uh, and that is disruptive. Um, I have uh, a, a, a colleague who's um, high level ad agency VP who started using mid journey and storyboarding, visualizing some of their ad campaign ideas. Um, and he recently did a client presentation and, and er, all the visuals were created by mid journey. And he didn't say anything until afterwards. And, they were quite intrigued. I had to ask him, I said, honestly, um, will your use of Mid Journey, and he, a copywriter himself, um, did that work? Uh, I said, will your use of that tool, be honest, will it reduce how much money you spend on designers, artists, graphic designers, illustrators, and so on? And his answer was, yes, it will. And now there are copywriting AIs that will put me out of business he said half jokingly, um, half jokingly because there's still a human behind the scenes who's driving this and curating and choosing what to show and has the intention, the vision, the idea. Um, I think that's what's most important, but there will be disruption, no doubt. There was with photography and, and sometimes it's good disruption. You know, the landscape painters moved into impressionism partly as a reaction to the advent of photography. And that's a good thing. It's some of the most loved artworks of all time. Oh, sorry, if I could just add one more thought. I mean, I, to yep. me, it's important to distinguish between what are we trying to achieve? Is it to have flourishing art or is it to assign rights of protection? Um, you know, those two things do not have to be, um, they're not one and the same, you know. Mm -hmm. it, and to that end, I think that the more art created, the better. Does it all have to be protected? I'm not a, I'm sort of somewhat uncertain on that one. 
that, that is a, a fascinating question because it brings us back to what we have copyright for. I always try to bring this debate of, you know, the, the reason why we have copyright. Is it to, to encourage and uh, encourage the arts as uh, uh, you have it in the United States? Or is it to uh, reward people for their efforts and uh, sort of uh, um, as, as a natural right? In many ways, I think that um, we have to start thinking of copyright potentially as a defense against uh, the proliferation of free works that could eventually um, be competing with uh, human creators. Um, if all of these works, and I think that's something that I keep repeating and, and, and telling people, you really should be thinking about the implication of having all of these works in the public domain, because it may not be in your best interest that absolutely millions and millions of works um, in the public domain. They may not be very good, but uh, some of them are actually really good. But if anyone can use them, anyone can use them. And that means they're not, not going to hire any musicians. They're not going to hire copywriters, as Daniel said. Uh, they're not going to hire uh, artists because it, the, I can just go on and, and type a prompt, but also I can just copy whatever anyone else created. I don't even need to have any effort of creating a good image. I just need to copy and paste someone else's. And I think that we haven't really been asking that question. Uh, sometimes we, we think too much about the legalities. And one of the reasons why I'm sort of a bit of an advocate in favor of copyright for these works is because I'm worried of the implications of the public domain uh, question. And, and I don't think we have, we have thought about it. Can I just jump in an important thing you, you, you said, a distinction you made, and there is a gray area here, but my biggest concern with that is direct copies of my work exactly as it is that someone else chooses to and is able to monetize. That would piss me off. I, you know, I make money licensing my artwork. For example, um, I, one of my images was on the Fenwick and West homepage for 15 months and and I made some good income on that if someone else was to grab that and do the same thing and license it as their own that would piss me off um so I think a distinction needs to be made between direct copies and attempting to monetize direct copies and remixes or you know some you know style transfer things like that I I I'm I feel a lot more open about that um yeah so, yeah I wanted to jump in with that issue. Like, I know one of the more controversial uses of AI art is to make art that's in the style of an established artist, especially when their style is very recognizable. And uh, I'd love to hear all the perspectives on that. Yeah, see, to me, that's one of those gray areas where, you know, you're right in the middle and you could argue it either way very easily. Um, you know, if it's something totally new and not an exact copy, uh, well, you know, I think it should be allowed. Uh, I, I would be disappointed if that person driving that AI ended up making lots of money and more than the original artist. <laughs> that would piss me off. Um, but, you know, just, remixing just, it to a much further degree is, is again, it's a spectrum, right? You know, two things. If we think about, again, if we are trying to do this with reference to copyright, as you know, they say ideas are never protected. I would think style would sort of fit that. But this notion of a follow on creator doing better than the original, I, again, it's, um, it's, we see it in the music industry where somebody's cover of a song does so much better than the original artist. It, you know, again, it's systemic or it's endemic to this idea of encouraging people to create. You know, we might not be thrilled with all the outcomes. But again, I mean, I'd rather a landscape where we encourage as much creativity as possible. But people doing covers pay a licensing fee to the original publisher, right? Uh, one, would, one would hope, yes. Uh, but, but I'm just thinking of, you know, somebody who makes a name for themselves by, you know, the original musician songwriter right. remains in obscurity. So, you know, they might have been compensated, but I just feel, you know, the effect of what their words, what their lyrics, you know, and that's the part that I will always see is like, yes, nothing wrong was, you know, there was nothing illegal about it, 
but there is that sort of life's like that moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, in the US, at least the trend has been for music that is in the style, like recognizably of another artist for that to be considered like a copyright, uh, like a, a copyright infringement, or at least a use that needed to be licensed. And I'm not sure how I feel about that as a, uh, <laughs> as a free licensing advocate. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, we, we look at what uh, at the case law coming out of the States and with horror. Um, thankfully, um, uh, thankfully, recently we had uh, the, the um, uh, what's his name? Um, Ed Sheeran? Uh, the Ed Sheeran case, exactly. Yeah, I, I was, I, I purposefully, my, my brain wants to forget his name, I guess. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, he, he did win a, a, a case that uh, I think on, in, in the US probably he would have lost. Huh. He wanted based on uh, precisely that uh, the, the similarity of the song that he had created wasn't similar enough. Yeah. Yeah, and Mark, uh, I'd I'd ask like, what's go what would you say is going on when it like, when that style is created like that's still the human acting, like or is it? Yeah. So what's going on inside the algorithms, right? So there's kind of two things. So often cases the prompt asks for a particular style, so someone will see art that they like and say, you know, type in in the style of. Um, now I think of this as the system has learned lots and lots of different styles. It's a very good imitator. Um, it won't ever reproduce. Um, it's not impossible. It's very unlikely it'll ever reproduce an exact art, especially if that in the style of is is at, something else is added to it. Um, at the at the lower levels, right? What it's actually doing is is mixing, matching, and a little bit of everything it's ever seen. So even when you say in the style of something, it's not truly, you're not invoking this notion of, um, you know, imitation, right? Uh, it can't kind of, it doesn't truly separate out like this is my Greg Rutowski, this is my, you know, Vermeer <laughs> section of my neural network or whatever. It's just a little bit of everything in there. So it is, it is in some sense the the artist that has seen everything, experienced everything, and can kind of shift their sentimentalities in different ways. There's an interesting question in the Q and A of people asking about the social impact. Uh, most of the people using AI AI art now to uh, to uh, inform their work are people who have a lot of access to computing power, to technology, things like that, and a lot of the the art that's getting used as inputs for these are for people who have like a lot less power, or a lot less access, or at least it just, uh, the system doesn't particularly care about like the relative power of whose, whose work is getting used. So uh, how do you feel about that? Does that inform your views of like what the, what the rights should be, like who should be able to claim authorship? Uh, um, this is a tricky one because I, um, even though some artists are quite popular, the Greg Rutowski is a great example of this. I think it's just some something that just happened because it, uh, he's not reproducing his style. And I, I, I don't know if uh, if we can talk about power of of, uh, of this artist. Um, it, sometimes I get worried that we are losing site that's that these data sets are incredibly large i mean um i mean i mean one of the data sets and um if you type my name it doesn't come up with me it just produces something entirely different so um i i the the power structures on this bother me a little bit because i don't think that we are we are entirely sure of who has power or or whether we can talk about power relationships right now other than um we are going to have to um reward artists and perhaps have a levy system or some form of uh, um system that rewards artists that are being included in the in, in the data set um in, and also allowing artists to opt out so perhaps that uh, that could be a, another option yeah I, I think opting out is 
is definitely uh, in order. Um, you know, this whole fear of someone who is not really an artist becoming powerful because they've copied some one other's work. Well, the chances of that happening, I can tell you, are very slim. <laughs> There's talk about a long tail curve. There's very few artists out there making any kind of a living from their art. Um, so that that's a fear that's not, I think, very well founded. But for sure, uh, the ability to opt out of these data sets, I, I, I think, should should be an option. There's another aspect to power, which is um, democratization of computing resources. And I think we're in a very special time in which the models have been made publicly available and are being hosted for free. You can go to websites for free and you know, use these generative tools. Um, that's not necessarily a given, right? So all these different companies can decide that they don't want to give these things out for free. And in some, you can even kind of argument that a lot of these companies that are giving access to free are are kind of using that to, to seek investment. And as soon as they get what they want, they don't have to, to give anything away for free. Um, and then there's there's also the issue of who can make the models, right? So Dali, Dali's still partially under wraps, stable diffusion is out there, but um, you know, you can use it, they're very powerful, but if you want to have something that's unique, a model that does what you want to do and doesn't do anything else, you know we're still in a stage where not everyone can do that either because they don't have the number of computers or the big enough computers or programming skills even right mm -hmm. so the programmer artist is, is a unique phenomenon that's happening as well yep another question from the q a which uh, is isn't it a good thing to have a robust public domain and uh, maybe I'll follow that with another question. Like, do you think this like explosion of AI uh, generated or AI assisted works uh, make creation and sharing better or worse for human creators who are trying to become artists? You know, many years ago, Jessica Littman wrote this wonderful uh, paper titled The Public Domain. And she makes a compelling argument that it's the public domain that sort of keeps the system of copyright functioning. That that is what allows us to you know, benefit, even if it's on an unconscious level, from everything that has come before. That those influences, those styles, those turns of phrase, you know, all the little bits that we have gained by exposure to the past. Um, if we were to dissect our own work, you know, who knows how much we would find of other people. But the public domain allows us to, you know, still produce something that's on our own. So, you know, it, it, to me, it's, it is on, I, I would like to look at the landscape of artistic endeavor, whatever it kind of, you know, whether it's music, art, literature or whatever, on that premise that we need that um, a willing, that ability to be able to use to draw from what has come before. Now, again, the scale is what is dramatically different or what is going to be dramatically different if we have millions of artificial intelligence uh, pieces, you know, sort of littering the, the public sphere. A litter is probably not a good choice of words. But again, I, I do think that the public domain is vital towards, you know, subsequent development, creativity, innovation, all, you know, a vital or a thriving civil, uh, civil sphere. So I would not want to see it diminished by steps we take to try to, you know, provide better copyright protection to AI, you know, with, even if, if, especially if there's no human involved. Um, I, I guess that's probably uh, also directed at me. I, of course, the public domain is absolutely vital. It is very, very important that we have a very robust uh, public domain. My concern is um, the proliferation of a public domain that uh, directly competes uh, with uh, with human creators. That's that's a very specific problem that I see uh, that we could have. Um, I, I think someone put in the questions that uh, Greg Rutowski's problem is that now there are more AI works um, with his name than his actual output. And that is 
I, I, that is a problem. I, I absolutely see that uh, that could be uh, potentially a problem. And if those works are not protected by copyright and he's competing with free works that are um, on, on s sort of uh, Greg Rotowski works that are free, I think that's a problem. And, and I, that, that's that's my main concern. So um, we, we have to make sure that we distinguish between the existence and the prevalence of a very strong uh, public domain is good, but, I, I, but it I, I could be problematic, yeah. You know, a thought just came to my mind, and I guess, Mark, you might be the person to answer it. And I know this would not go over well in the United States, but to me, you know, attaching someone's name to a work, you know, without their involvement, without their consent is just such a flagrant violation of moral rights. I mean, in the algorithms to come, is it not viable to build those sorts of safeguards in? Safeguards, um, tricky, right? Because to what extent, all right, so in the style of, right? So it's hard to hard to differentiate style. I could probably reproduce someone's style with different keywords. So high fantasy, epic, you know, intense lighting, trending on our station, you know, whatever, right? Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I do not personally like using, you know, in the style of an artist's name, um, because I think there, you, that does kind of take away from them, um, but it is in the data set, right? We can build our beta, data sets differently. Um, I don't know if this is 100% true, but, you know, OpenAI, who made Dolly, try, did, bought a lot of kind of art, used a lot of open, um, you know, Creative Commons open art stable diffusion we don't know if they added more to it uh stable diffusion pretty much just scraped everything off the internet right and didn't give a whole lot of consideration for for the rights of the artists so you know it's it's possible to build clean models for what we might think of as you know yeah permission uh, permission given sort of art right see i i think greg is crazy to be concerned about this issue um first of all um, I challenge any other human dabbling in Greg Rotowski style art that has his name tagged to achieve the level of success that Greg has and notoriety. If anything, that just makes him more famous and probably more able to monetize his own work. Um, when I started getting involved in the NFT space a couple of years ago, uh, I had some uh, when I first got onto Super Rare uh, about two years ago, I had a couple of collectors um, reach out to me and and had long conversations with them. And you know what I've been doing, they, they kind of opened my mind about this idea of exposing uh, the full resolution giant artworks I'm making, which I've always hidden in the past behind uh, zoomable browsers, um, so as to not allow copying. And their comment was, well, first of all. You can't. This whole idea of right-click copy, you know, why should I, um, uh, you know, care if someone copies my work is only going to make me more notable. They'll eventually find out it's mine. Um, and it's easy enough to write a script to download all the pieces of, of the, the zoomed-in work and, and piece it together. Um, the nice thing about NFTs, and there's a whole other conversation is it's a certificate of authenticity that enables only one collector to say that they own it and can trade it and sell it. Um, and of course, uh, there's a, a blockchain enabled, you know, uh, provenance that shows that it was your work in the first place. So it really opened my mind about uh, not being overly concerned about my work getting out there in its full glory. Um, everything I've seen since, and, and I, I would love to have a conversation directly with Greg about this. I think it's only going to help him, to be honest. I, you know, I kind of, I sort of agree with this. Um, I'm not an artist. Um, uh, the value systems around art have to change and they've changed every time new technologies have come in, right? So originally photography was, you know, looked down upon. Um, you know, I think, you know, what we value, what we consider as collectible or, you know, things we're willing to pay for money, you know, we're in a moment of time where our value systems change very slow and our technology changes very fast. And I think things will smooth out and we'll either decide that, you know, 
Um, I only ever want to see generated art and, um, but remember there's still a human in, in the loop there. Or we will say, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, consider the amount of human effort that went into this. Um, and that will be a part of the value that's involved here. I think we've never seen a situation where we can generate art as fast um, as, as someone can. And, and not to change the topic, but I, I love the fact that people who are not classically trained or have any training in art uh, uh, can, can see their visions come to life. And sometimes that just means the art has meaning to them and they're not rushing out to, to sell it. You know, right? There's value in, in a meme, the last five seconds. There's value in me seeing something that I could never draw come to life on my computer. I share it, it's ephemeral, it's kind of gone, right? So this is an example of how you know, different classes of art and art appreciation and, and what we do with the art as observers can change. Just further- Yeah, I would like, I, no, oh, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Mayor. No, I was gonna say further to the idea of things will smooth out. Um, you know, again, if we think about technological disturbance when, you know, Nap from Napster to where we are today, um, you know, what was rampant piracy has now, you know, turned itself into a thriving digital market for, you know, digital uh, music. So it's, th there is an, an expectation, uh, or I think a reasonable expectation that some of these problems will, will ful be fulfilled or sorted out in the fullness of time. Yeah. Any other but visions of the- there will be headaches before that happens, right? And chaos and uncertainty and- confusion yep. and scams you know, so. but, but i would err on the side of this flourishing um artists seek inspiration um you know i go to a lot of museums the ability to go to many of those museums online and and use zoomable browsers to really inspect the thousands and thousands of works really helps inform my vision um so i i i love the the flowering of of um of these visuals that that's happening and the proliferation it only adds to inspiration the other thing i i just wanted to um kind of not push back on so much but but just point out mark is that uh effort is another thing that i think is misunderstood in art um you know this idea of like how long did it take you to make that you know like you know you know how skilled do you need to be to actually make that I think is also a red herring. Again, I'm more oriented towards vision and ideas than the actual mechanisms of, of creating the work. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure this idea of being rewarded for effort makes as much sense. Although a lot of people kind of see it that way, I think a more informed um, a notion is being rewarded for vision. Yeah, I'm not in disagreement with you, I think, but I think it's the, the effort is often lost in the computational art perspective. So I, I needed something for uh, one of my presentations the other day and I pulled up stable diffusion and I probably worked with stable diffusion for two hours to get the image just right. You know, changing my prompt, which means changing my vision, right? Curating, all that stuff go, comes into play. And it's different, it's maybe different effort than we're used to thinking of as effort. It's not, you know, me with the paintbrush or, or things like that, right? But, but I think, you know, but if you, that if has you got to it right come into in, play. But if you got it right in one minute instead of two hours, would that work then there's still division, value? Right? So there were still, you? no, no. Well, this is complicated, right? First of all, this never happens. <laughs> me, it could. maybe I'm bad Imagine at it. a thought experiment. <laughs> I'm going right. to jump in. No, now. but but I mean that's why I'm saying like the the vision is also part of it, right? You can't. I, I guess what I'm saying is yes, and right. The vision is there, the effort is there. You know, all of it kind of has to factor in, uh, and we have to be conscious of this too, right? So I'm going to jump in now because we're coming up close to the end of the hour, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask one last question. Is like, what is one misunderstanding that you'd like to correct, or one thing that you hope everybody comes away from this? Uh, knowing that they didn't know before. I'll pass it around and yeah. Mark, since I jumped yeah. in uh, on you, I'm gonna start with you. Go you're starting with me. Yeah, I um, am. Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or if anybody um, would like to. Uh... I mean, I think, you know, the, the 
I guess the message that I have is that, you know, the, there's still vision, there's still intent. It still comes from the human. The human is still a part of the, the loop in this process. And that, you know, we might, if you're not familiar with these technologies, they're not kind of one shot deals, right? They, they integrate into a process and an amateur might not have, you know, what they think of as a formal process, but there's always an artistic process. Um, so these, to me, you know, I think of these tools, I'm deep in the algorithms, but, you know, maybe that helps me understand that these things are just more complicated tools and we've always had tools in our art. Going around my screen again, how about uh, Andres? Um, I think that we get too focused on uh, effort as uh, Daniel and Mark were, uh, were discussing. Um, I think that intention is very important, but also uh, we, we already reward very low um, effort things like photography. In, in many ways, you can, you can get copyright for something like that. So I think that just a, a system that will reward um, um, that level of, of, of uh, intention that someone wants to create a work of art and has done the steps necessary, um, there's no reason why they shouldn't get uh, copyright. Um, sort of... Uh, uh, proposing again the 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 UK law, um, uh, we don't have a test on effort. It's just a computer generated work. Um, uh, the author is whoever made the arrangements necessary for the work to come to into existence, and that gets fifty years protection. And you remove all of the questions about effort, about um, intention, and all sorts of things, and then you get a very nice chunk of, of potentially of, um, of protection. And I think that's probably uh, the way forward that I would have advocate. I've been advocating for a while. Uh, Mira? You know, since um, this is an opportunity to think outside of the system that we already have, um, I, I would be, I'd be very interested in a system of protection that is not, you know, the lifetime of a person plus 50 years. I think the term of copyright is already too long. And if we are going to see masses of such works, you know, populating the, the public sphere, um, I would think that a, a shortened level of protection would might strike a better balance between, um, you know, encouraging other people to learn from what is being produced around them and offering some rights of control to the, whomever it is we're going to designate the author. Daniel, last word. Yeah, I just want to say I would totally agree with Mira on that. Um, because honestly, if, um, if an artist doesn't reach a level of viability within a couple decades, they're not probably going to in 50 years and in which case um well then they're probably already dead and as we know <laughs> many artists end up becoming successful after that point so uh but i guess uh, what i'd like people to come away with is this distinction i started with in the beginning of the talk which is between original content and original vision um and this ties into this whole effort uh, uh whole concept of effort again in art um, in that article, I, I wrote that I, I shared a link to uh, where I really, it, it's kind of a manifesto, but it's more about asking questions. One question I ask is, if an artist was able to manifest their artistic vision fully formed with a snap of their fingers, would that artwork have no value? Um, and, you know, I think this is a question that this was written five years ago, but it's, it's suddenly it's becoming close to, to that that we're seeing happen. Um, it still takes some effort, but it's getting much easier. So I think uh, vision, um, inspiration, ideas uh, will have to become uh, of, of greater primacy. Okay. Well, thank you all for a great conversation and for giving your time to, uh, to talk to everybody about AI outputs. Uh, the attendees, thank you all for coming, and uh, you should get a link with the recording uh, later if you'd like to either see this again or share it with your friends. Uh, again, uh, thank you all, and we'll see you at our next event. And thank you, Creative Commons, for having us. Thanks. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Great. Take care. Have a great rest of bye your bye day. Bye-bye now.